So we're talking about desperate, desperate measures or desperation today. And so from the involvement standpoint, um, finish this sentence for me. Desperate times call for... Okay, y'all gonna get the routine. That won't be your last time to participate uh, today. Desperate times call for desperate measures. And so if you ask chat GPT in the artificial intelligence world to define desperation, um, you can see if you look at the definition, there's a lot, I'm not gonna read it all, but you can see there's some pretty edgy and some pretty extreme words like state of despair, no other, no other options or hope. Um, an intense emotional state of hopelessness. Extreme actions take dra- to take drastic or risky measures. Acute need to escape or resolve the dire circumstances. So there's really nothing casual. When we say the word desperation, there's nothing casual about it. Okay? So that's, that's going to be a theme as we go through today. And so as There's probably, I would guess, about 200 people here today. And there's no doubt in my mind, with 200 people, you get 200 people in any setting, and we're all going to be, we're going to be all over the place in this this idea of desperation. And some came in today, and it may be, you may be in the most desperate place in your life, and some may be on top of the world, and there may be no desperation at all. So you've got a listener guide. I do not want you to wave it in the air. Um, but in your listening guide, what I want you to do is this, is I want you to think of a number between one and 10 of where you walked in today, desperation wise. And number 10 would be the most desperate you've ever been in your entire life. If you think back to that situation, what it included, just that place you were at, at that time. And one, just think about that as the best time in your life. So really no, no desperation at all. And so I want you to put a number, pick a number, write it on your sheet of paper of where you are today, just so you can get your mind in kind of thinking, um, okay, this is where I'm at. And we want God to speak to that today, where you're at. Um, and I would guess though, as you thought about your number 10, we all have a number 10, by the way, 100% of the people have a number 10. They are all different. They're all different extremes. Um, but I would guess it involved a couple of, of, of ingredients. The first one would be the situation you were in was really, was probably pretty dire. It, physical state, either just because life handed you something, or two, maybe it was a decision you made. Maybe you put yourself in that situation, and, and we do that. And then I would also guess it involved an element of when you looked at the, your actions and ability to get out of it, the, probably the options were fairly small and you couldn't really see, see the answer. And so I uh, started following Christ when I was 12 years old. I am 32 today, so that is... 20, <laughs> so I'm 56, so 44 years um, I've been doing this Christian thing. And I've noticed a, a pattern in my own life just over the last few years that started occurring to me is when I came to know Christ, there was a level of desperation that I understood that I was a sinner, I was separated from God, and I was not going to heaven, and I wanted to go to heaven. It was just that simple at 12 years old. And from that time forward, my, my faith walk has looked like this, flat doing the church thing, and then I go through a desperate time. Um, Maybe it's my mom passing away when I was in college, and it really, I pursued God. God showed up. I I, uh, grew to know him more and better, and then I came out of that, and then I kind of flatlined. I do the church thing. Sherry and I had infertility problems. I saw God move in that as testament by that row over there. I mean, unbelievable, man. And so I saw him, I saw him move. And I could go on with all, but that was the pattern. And so I started, um, I kind of asked, like, why is it? Why is it that it's those desperation times or the growth times? And when God is providing, when times are good, it's like I flatline. And so I've come to the conclusion 
So I didn't mention I'm an engineer. So y'all are going to laugh when you start seeing some of the things that I come up with because I put everything through. If I can create a formula for it, I'm going to do it. And, and I think I kind of did that today, but there's three main components that I, that I have come to the conclusion based on my experience that are involved in desperation. The first one is their current state. It involves something going on in our current state that is probably not good. There's actions and ability. Well, there's, let me jump to the desired state. And there's a desired state. There's a difference between your current state and your desired state. And then there's the actions and the ability in the middle that, that can get us there. Okay? So those are the... I can tell you in my own life, my latest... Like when I thought about my 10 on that scale of desperation scale, my 10 was about seven years ago. And seven years ago, I was in a pretty, pretty tough spot. I, my dad, our dad passed away. He lived a great life, um, but it was a, a tough, to, it's a tough to lose your dad. Work was not good at all, was way out of balance. And, and I really didn't think there was a way out. And so, go ahead, Eric, hit that next one. And so it looked, if I put that through kind of this, this equation to kind of test, test that, my current state was that I had gotten way out of balance with work. Um, I was not happy, stuck, stressed. I ended up leaving my job before I had another one. I had put my identity in my job. So you can imagine at the time I left what I had put my identity in. So there was a lot of questions. Um, and then the actions and ability, I really had no idea how to move and not put myself right back in that situation because that's, that's what I had done um, repeatedly. And I was really spiritually at that time, I was in one of these, hey, I'm busy with work, and I was flatlined. I was checking the box. You know, I, I knew I was supposed to have a quiet time, right? So, I, yeah, I'd read the verse of the day. I'd go and, you know, I'd pray before meals, and I was checking the box, though. And what I really wanted is I wanted to encounter God, and I wanted to feel God like I encountered him when he answered our prayer for um, having kids. I really wanted to encounter him like I had felt after I lost my mom and he, he gave peace, right? Um, I wanted to be a good husband. I wanted to leave a legacy. I wanted to have a meaningful job, you know, probably in that order. And so that was, that was, that was really my, my 10. And I don't have time to go into the details of that, but over a period of three or four weeks, I mean, God just showed up in a major way. It, it was amazing. It was probably one of the most amazing times in my, one of the big, greatest encounter that I've, I've ever had in God. And I came out of that season, man, and I was so pumped for Jesus, just what he had done and how he'd provided. And, and, um, and so I think the bottom line when we talk about the title of the message today, Desperate Times Call for desperate measures, I think based on my experience that I am, point one is that I think that is true. I do think that desperate times call for desperate measures. And so we're going to talk about that um, this morning. And really, I'm not going to focus. I think in the Christian community, we put a lot of focus, and, and we should, about the really the tough physical times that we're going through, our current state. We focus a lot on that. But the question I've got today is how, how do we stay desperate when things get good? How do we stay desperate for God when, man, life is just rolling and it isn't, we are in good shape? How do we do that? Because I, I don't know that I've figured it out because clearly my pattern reflects that I, that I haven't. And so is it possible that, that we, could, we could say, let's see if this works, good times calls for yeah, it's kind of weird, right? It doesn't, it doesn't exactly roll off the tongue. But that's kind of the question that we're going to talk about. And so, so a lot of y'all know, because I've talked about it up here before, that I'm involved in uh, God of Hope Ministries. It's a ministry, a discipleship ministry for prisoners, uh, at, for both men and women. I, I minister at Travis County State Jail, and I, I disciple these guys. And the pattern of discipleship we use is three things. We talk about the very st first time I meet when we talk about you need to know, and Joel talked about it earlier, you need to know, 
You need to be and you need to do. So any, you can always put, anytime you read scripture, anytime you're studying, any, anytime you're trying to live this Christian life, you need to know, be, do. And we're going to go through that today. Um, on your listener guide, you're going to see kind of this, I call it the desperation equation. Um, but you're going to see that. And so that, that's really, we're going to talk about um, all three of those elements. But we're going to try to look through God's eyes because, hit that next slide, Eric. So I, I think as you look at this, um, go back one. So as you look at this equation of really determining what desperate times look like, I think we can agree if you just look at the items and go, what's the world say about this? And then what's God say about it? And I think you can just intuitively say that it, they're going to be different because they are for me. When I, I know there are many times I take a worldly view and, man, I, I want to be comfortable. That's my desired state. Like, I want to be comfortable. I want to have a lot of stuff. Like, I want a good job. That, that's what I want. And I, I want to do stuff with my, within my own abilities. I want to keep everything like, like this is the ability I have, and I just want to use that to get there, right? And I, but I think um, if you look at, let's t take God's perspective, starting with the desired state. So looking in Matthew on the desired state of how, what Jesus says about what the desired state or the goal, the target that, that we should have. So in a period of about 12 chapters, and don't worry, we're not gonna, I'm not gonna ask you to turn to all these, but we're gonna flip through these pretty, pretty quick. Jesus gives a very clear picture of what the desired state is. And he says, in Matthew 10, he says, whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy, worthy of me. That's pretty stark, I and mean, that's pretty crazy, right? Matthew 13, he says, the kingdom of heaven, he uses two illustrations. One, the kingdom of heaven is like a buried treasure. A man finds the treasure, he reburies it, he goes and sells everything he has, and he goes and he buys the field. He gives everything up for it. And the second illustration, the kingdom of heaven is like a fine pearl. And a man wants the pearl, and he basically goes and sells all he has and buys the pearl. And then he talks to his disciple. These are his, these are his 12 guys, right? His 12 closest friends. And he says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever will lose their life will find it. And then Matthew 19, the rich young ruler comes to him and says, teacher, what must I do to be saved? Jesus says, follow the 10 commandments. And he says, I, I've done that. And then he says, okay, go sell all that you have. And he walked away sad, okay? And then, and I don't think in that case, by the way, and a lot of these are about selling your possessions, and it's not about the possessions, I just wanna make that clear. It's about him being above the possessions, right? Or anything else that we value that much. And then lastly, Jesus is talking with the, the Pharisees, and they're trying to trap him, trying to catch him, and they said, teacher, what, what is the greatest commandment? And he says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, right? So when you look at the conclusion on this, on the desired state, like Jesus was not playing. He was not mincing words uh, in here. And he is serious that, that this is an all-in thing. The desired state in this desperation equation is an all-in state. And so, right off the bat, I don't know about you, but I am feeling uncomfortable already because that's not really what, I built for, what I'm built for. See, we can go to the actions and abilities and maybe we'll get some reprieve there on this, but when you look at the actions and abilities part of it, kind of that second thing, um, second element, and Paul kind of speaks to that because I would hope my go-to usually is like, man, I can outwork this thing. I can, I can be disciplined for God. I can, man, I can show up for church, every, you know, at least three Sundays a month. But Paul makes it pretty clear. And I, want, I, don't, I just want you to look at me and listen to it. I'm going to read it out of the message. Again, be, be a little careful with the message, but I really love what it, what it says here. And here's Paul in Romans 
in the letter he wrote to the Romans. And he says this. Oh, by the way, this is the guy who wrote 13 of the 27 uh, books in the New Testament. Okay, this is a guy, if there's anybody that, I, that I've seen in the Bible, um, we just got through study, done studying Paul at the youth house, right? But if there's anybody that I think has a shot at saying that they model this idea of being desperate for God, it's him. And here's what he says. Yes, I'm full of myself. After all, I have spent a long time in sin's prison. What I don't understand about myself is that I decide one way, but then I act another, doing things I absolutely despise. So if I can't be trusted to figure out what is best for myself and then do it, it becomes obvious that God's command is necessary. Skipping down to 21, he says, it happens so regularly that it's predictable. The moment I decide to do good, sin is there to trip me up. I truly delight in God's commands, but it's pretty obvious that not all of me joins in that delight. Part, parts of me covertly re rebel, and just, the, just when I least expect it, they take charge. I have tried everything, he says, and nothing helps. I'm at the end of my rope. And then he says, is there no one that can do anything for me? Isn't that the real question? And then the pause, and here's what the answer is. The answer, thank God, is that Jesus Christ can and does. He acted to set things right in this life of contradictions where I want to serve God with all my heart and mind, but I am pulled by the influence of sin to do something totally different. So when you look at the actions and ability, the, the conclusion is that we were not built, I was not built to go all in on anybody but myself. I was built to go all in on me, on my happiness and my comfort and my stuff. And so we weren't built for that. And then if we go to the last, kind of the last element, we talk about, a, a, about our current state and what scripture says and what the truth is about our current state and the importance of it, or maybe the lack their importance. Um, Paul in Corinthians talks about, I'm not gonna read all the verses, but he uses words like the outer self is wasting away. And he says, for the, he uses this idea of things seen and not seen. The things seen, the stuff I can get my hands on, the things I want here on earth, the, for things that are seen are transient. They're temporary in nature, right? It's a perspective. And the things that are unseen are eternal. In Philippians 4, he goes on to say, by the way, Philippians 4, probably my favorite chapter in the entire Bible. And he talks about this idea of contentment and talks about the idea of having a little and, and having much. And he says this, he says, in any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. And the secret is I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, right? Y'all, most of y'all have heard that verse. These are popular verses, right? But the beauty is Paul is basically saying, regardless of the circumstance, whether I have a bunch or I have a little, the secret is exactly the same. And then in Philippians 3, he, he talks about the things that he acquired on earth, his skills, his growing up, his status, that he says, I count them as rubbish. So the conclusion is this on the current state, is that how we define our current state, which I have done for years and years, because that's basically the way I have de defined desperation, um, it can't be trusted. And so if you put all of that together in, in determining this, this idea and the, the pieces that go into desperate times, and you look at that together, I think there can be no conclusion other than that regardless, regardless of our current situation, what's on the left, whether you walked in here today at a 10 or a one, and not minimizing that, because God cares about your current situation. I promise you, he's demonstrated that over and over. The Bible speaks to that so much. The people he gravitated to were the people at the tens, right? So it's not minimizing that. But regardless of that state, if you just look at the actions and ability in the desired state, the mark is too high to get there on our own, and Jesus is the only answer. And that, that is my conclusion number one of the thesis, is that we as believers are in desperate times. We are always in desperate times because we cannot get there by ourselves. We cannot achieve this standard. So I think at this point, 
a lot of light bulbs went on for me as I studied this. It was awesome. Like God has always just spoke to me in, in my own life, and um, which is why I picked these topics, because I know at least one person's going to get something out of it. <laughs> but the thing I still have the problem with in this equation is this, is this idea of following Christ as an all-in proposition, because I've still got this thing inside of me, like, I, I just don't know. Like, how, how do I get there? How do, is it worth it? And so I want to talk just briefly about this idea of the B. We talked about the no. Let's talk about the B. Let's talk about if you you are going to adopt and I am going to adopt this as truth today in our life, okay? And how do we do that? And and Paul speaks to that as well. Paul speaks to a lot of stuff in the New Testament. Um, In 2 Corinthians, um, I would say my second, 2 Corinthians 5, my second favorite chapter now in the Bible just over the last year. God has really been working on me on this. It it says this, for Christ's love, for the love of Christ controls us because we have, the NIV version says compels, so controls or compels us because we have concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live may no longer live for, them, for themselves, but for him who for their sake, for my sake, for your sake, died and was raised. So this is not something we conjure up ourselves. This is not something we can try hard to go, okay, yeah, I'm going to really make myself go all in on Jesus. We are compelled by Christ's love. Christ's love is everything. And if, so if I'm speaking to you today right now and you're kind of on the fence on Christ's love, a lot of the stuff I'm saying isn't going to totally work. It has to start with Christ. The fact is this. I'm a sinner. I was separated. And the wages of that sin is death, Romans 6.23. That separated me from God forever. And, but while I was still a sinner, while you were still a sinner, Christ died for you. He paid the price that you were supposed to pay, that I was supposed to pay. And all we have to do is believe. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, you put him number one, you put him as boss, you go the all in thing, and you believe that God raised him from the dead, you shall, you shall be saved. So that is the foundation when we talk about this, this, this idea of staying in desperation for God that we always have to come back to. And so that ties right into um, the last few minutes when we're going to talk about desperate, desperate measures. And this was about three sermons in one. So we're going to hit these desperate measures pretty quickly. Um, and number one has a lot to do with what we just talked about, about being. But there is nothing that takes the, the place of meaningful, focused time with God. And, and without that, it is absolutely impossible to maintain a vibrant relationship with God. It's just impossible to do that without one-on-one time. Time in prayer, time in scripture. Um, John Hanna in this book, uh, Desperate for Jesus, said it pretty well, I think. He says, I'm often asked, how do you get to that place in your life where you're desperate for Jesus? And my answer is straight to the point. You won't get there unless you have an encounter with Jesus. Religion won't get you to that place. Coming to Canyon Church won't get you into that place. Others, people, faith won't get you into that place. I can talk all day, but until you have a personal encounter with him, you won't know the real Jesus, who the real Jesus is. Only when we encounter him as Lord and Savior do we become desperate to know him more. This is the place where the encounters with Jesus happen. Time with God. Number two, do community. So find, engage in a desperate community. Find, and that community can look like this big room, but the truth of the matter is, Hebrew says, let us us stir one another up. Hebrew says, let us encourage one another. This is encouraging to see faces, but I'll just be honest, this, it's pretty tough to stir one another up in this hour. It is, so my, kind of the twist on this do community that I want to, I want to encourage you and challenge you with, find a smaller group of community. It can be one person. It can be 10. I've got a group of guys I meet with on Thursdays. We stir it up all the time, sometimes in a good way, sometimes in a bad way. Amen. Can I? Thank you. 
So, um, but we have, we have fun and we do life together. And the beauty of that is we'll get to that. And some Thursdays, there are guys that are just at the, spiritually at the bottom, and they're in the basement, uh, not calling any names. But no, they're at the basement. But at that same time, there's always a few that are just really pursuing and desperate for God. And that's the way this community works. You show up, you might be at the bottom, and others are going to show up to encourage and stir up. The next one is remember, desperation measure number three. So in the good times, remember the source that it came from. When I was in prison a couple weeks ago, I told my guys I was preaching on this. I said, what, man, how do you stay desperate in the good times? And, and almost in use, and they said, we just got to remember where it came from. I'm like, okay, that was pretty simple. I guess we'll just do that then. Um, and then if you're at a tough time today or during those tough times, a lot of times it's, it's remembering more, looking back at his faithfulness, right? And seeing the past faithfulness, you can have confidence of the future faithfulness. All right, let's go to number four. So fill the spaces. So a little different, but the challenge to you is to create as many chances as possible for God to speak to you during your day and your week. And a lot of those come in the spaces, right? Yes, you need to have dedicated alone time with God. But there's a lot of space during the day. Uh, some of you probably right now are thinking, especially the young crowd over there with kids, are thinking, yeah, I got no space. There ain't no space. Um, but our drive time, our workout time, the cleaning time, the house time, put God in that space. Podcast, there's, I mean, the resources are unlimited, podcasts and worship music and sermons and um, other things. So fill the spaces. And then lastly, probably the thing that has, has probably impacted me the most just over the last six or seven years since my kind of reset period is just to say yes. Say yes. God has a, the, there is not a person in here that God, especially if you have already professed Christ as your savior, every one of us has a job to do. Every one of us has, to, has a job to do. The verse in 2 Corinthians by Paul, where he says, Christ's love compels. You go a few verses down, here's what he says. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us, gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. Praise the Lord. He didn't. And he has committed to us the message of re reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through his. That, that is why God wants us to stay desperate. He, he wants the relationship. He wants to be with us. But he has a job for us to do, and it's up to us if we are going to say yes and follow through. And the beauty is we're all made up differently He's going to give us all a different assignment or many of us different assignments and your job is to say yes. So today I, I rest my defense in this that as believers we are in desperate times. I'm 100% convinced of that and that was the light bulb moment for me. And we know in looking at this that desperate times call for desperate measures. We hope the message you just watched encourages your faith and helps you to follow Jesus more closely. And if you've never given your life to Jesus, we want to share with you how you can do that. If you text the word DECIDE to the number that's going to be on your screen, someone from our team is going to follow up with you and help answer any questions you might have about following Jesus. Also want you to know thank you so much for your support of our church, both for our church family and our extended family. The only way we can bring messages like the one you just watched is through your generosity. If you would like to support the work that God is doing through our ministry, you can go to sunsetcanyonchurch.org and click on the button that says give. We hope you have a great week and pray that God continues to work in your life in the days to come.